But, um, you know, I, 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 I'm very interested in the sound itself, which is what musicians produce. And it isn't, I mean, it isn't a neutral thing, is it? You don't think of it as just, just producing a sound, do you? I mean, there's, there's a lot to it. Uh, besides the merely technical, or would you say it's just a technical thing? No, no, it is, of course it is not a technical thing. And uh, in fact, uh, the only definition about music that can be accepted, if you want, as philosophically correct, is a definition, definition through sound, mm. because everything else speaks about the, uh, the reaction of the, the, of the beholder, the observer. Right, right. Uh, and I think Buzoni was, you know, who said it's sonorous air. That's really, hmm. it sounds terribly simple, but it's really, in the end, uh, all it is. And I think that sound, when people speak about sound, they speak about sound as of a sound spectacular, or a beautiful sound, or a dark sound, or a bright sound, or an ugly sound or a beautiful sound. But these are all uh, very um, empirical uh, definitions. They have nothing to do really with the matter itself. And I think if you observe sound, your certain things are immediately obvious. First of all, it doesn't inhabit the world. In other words, you have to bring him. You have to bring it to the room. It's not that the sound is there. Everything, all the, the, the technical means that we have uh, developed technological developments to preserve sound are artificial, it's like a deep freeze. I mean, whether it is cassette or records, or the sound itself doesn't exist. The Beethoven 7 that we played yesterday doesn't exist anymore today. It will exist somewhere in the corner of the earth when... But, uh, so when you observe, then, then you have to observe the relationship between sound and silence. Be very often it is talked about the beauty of the relation between two sounds. The first is the relation between the first sound and that, that comes sounds. after the silence that precedes it. And, and from then on. And I think if you observe it, then you see that sound has <clears throat> a relationship with silence, not unlike the law of gravity. In other words, to lift an object from the ground, you have to use so much energy to sustain it in the air, you have to add energy, otherwise it falls, falls down. And it's the same thing with the sound. You need so much energy to produce the sound. And you have to keep on giving the energy after that in order to maintain it. Now, this is relatively easy to understand when you're talking about a wind player who has so much air, or even a string instrument who, by drawing the, the bow, bow yeah. can sustain it. Mm -hmm. And this is what shows you that the art of playing the piano is the art of creating illusion, because in the piano, so to speak, you cannot, you cannot do that. And it is exactly this tension in the relationship between sound and silence that begins to give the music its expressive quality. In other words, if you produce one sound and sustain it, for a certain amount of time, and then let it die, you have experienced exactly that, a small death. Mm -hmm. And I think this is for me why there is a tragic quality inherent in the idea, in the concept of music, regardless of whether it is a comic opera or a funny finale of a Haydn symphony. At, at its most lighthearted, there is an element of, of of, of tragedy in music that comes from that. And, I mean, somebody like Wagner, uh, who, who was so obsessed with the, with the creation of a particular sound, is that, uh, is, that, is that part of, I mean, I've often tried to figure out, I mean, you know, I mean, was Beethoven that interested in the, in the quality of the sound and the whole context of the I sound? I don't think so. I think that this no. is a phenomenon that started that happening in the 19th century. Yeah, it's a developmental thing. I think I so. I mean, because, you know, you have the instance of Bach, for example, where it's clearly not specified what instruments are playing. I mean, you know, the art of fugue could be played on an organ, could be played on a cembalo, could be played by an orchestra. It's sort of unimportant to him, really, what the sound is. I think that Wagner was, uh, I mean, he was a very systematic person. 
also, and he was uh, uh, tried to bring everything to a level of, of, of consciousness. And mm. Wagner was interested not only in the color of sound, but in the exp expressivity of the continuity of sound. In other words, that the sound that keeps going in itself uh, creates tension. And of course, added to that all the harmonic uh, uh, complexities, mm -hmm. the famous Tristan chord and the, and the resolution of the dissonance, or rather the half resolution, half so resolution. that every Long answer yes. brings in itself another question. It's very Talmudic, actually. Yeah. Right. I mean, he would yeah. <laughs> turn in his grave if he heard me say it, but I believe that very much, yeah. you know, and I, it very often comes to mind when I conduct Tristan, which I've conducted so many times because it is a piece that, that is extremely important to me, but I'm very concerned already after the first two bars of the Tristan prelude, and you get already the first half resolution, which in itself poses another question. Another question. This is really very Talmudic in many ways. But in any case, Wagner's uh, 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 preoccupation with the... Although, excuse me, uh, there's a, I recall a, a line of, of Adorno's about uh, uh, the Tristan prelude, where he says, in a certain way, Wagner also doesn't really face the consequences of that half resolution. He immediately goes into a kind of episodic repetition, just a half a step higher or whatever it is. In other words, he, he can be, in other words, he finds something rather unusual. And instead of developing it, say, the way Beethoven did, he just repeats it as an episode rather than giving it the kind of force. Do you, do you see that? I don't agree with you. You don't agree with I that. don't agree with it. I, I mean, he, uh, he makes it appear again. I prefer that expression to the repetition, but he makes it appear again one step higher. Right. It's true. But in order for the third time to move on. I see. So you see it all as, as accumulation. The third time, accumulation. Right. Accumulation. I think that the principle of accumulation mm. in Wagner is as important as the principle of fragmentation in Beethoven. In other words, Beethoven makes a statement and then takes part of it and develops it as right. a fragment. Right. This is right. what I mean by the fragmentation right. Right. of Beethoven. In Wagner, it is a, a, a accumulation mm. for me. Mm. And this sort of uh, ability to sustain the sound. This is part of his sort of uh, um, musical anti-Semitism, in a way, about this, what he called the Jewish way of making music, you know, with sort of ups and downs and the phrasing and not sustaining the sound. I mean, if you want, it was an intellectual justification for his other ideas. I must say, <clears throat> he did not limit that only to the Jews. I mean, he criticized, of course, Italians. the Italians and the mm -hmm. French. So, mm -hmm. But this is what he's... But do, you, but do you think, I mean, this is what, what one thing about Wagner that, that uh, is interesting to me as you describe him. Do you, do you think this uh, obsessional quality that he has, uh, the obsessional attention he pays to the production of this continuous sound, uh, is has a kind of ideological dimension as well. In other words, you know, I mean, that there is... You can, for me, it's very difficult to separate Wagner, the great composer, from Wagner, the kind of phenomenon, the cultural phenomenon. And I just wonder whether, you know, it, even if you looked at it as pure music or the, the creation of a sound, say, in, in Tristan, whether you're not already entering another territory uh, which is which is ideological. I mean that this is something. It's a particular sound. It's a particular type of um, mood that he wants, etc., etc. In the end, it's part of a German project. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Maybe going in the direction of a kind of nationalism, where he's very anxious to separate himself from the Italian guitar. Oh yes, and, and all of that. You see yes. what I'm trying but to I say? But I mean, this this cultural nationalism in Germany is a phenomenon that. Grew, grew uh, yes. uh, and well before the Nazis, you know, and you. No, I know, but I mean, but you see, but it is you. You do see it as a development, really, throughout the nineteenth century. It doesn't suddenly appear with Wagner. No, I think it was gradual. I think it was gradual. I think it was gradual, and but I have no, I have no problem with the characterization mm. of a national element in, in an artistic matter. 
be it sound or something else. In other words, I have absolutely no problem with the definition of something as a German sound or a French sound or, or an Italian sound. And in the case of, of Germany, of course, it, it, uh, it, it has um, much more important connotation because it led to the nationalism and the national socialism and, and, and Hitler, etc. But where, for me, this national, this sort of artistic nationalism becomes fascistic is the moment it is expected that only a person of that nation can actually understand that. In other words, for me it is understand obvious it that this is produce it. A produce it. Yeah. Especially, yes. typically German. And it is so Germanic, it is absolutely 100% no German. Yeah. But no outside. And if you read, in fact, if you read the uh, 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 articles of Furtwängler, uh, uh, I think there were articles or the letters, they were published in any case, about uh, Toscanini's visit to Berlin. Mm. which on a superficial level was always meant uh, uh, were excused as, as jealousy. I don't think so at all. I mean, he speaks about that. How can this Italian understand this concept, the concept of German, Germanness? Uh, but how do you, I mean, I, 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 I find that repulsive, of course, because it's, a, uh, you know, the idea that only certain people have access to a certain of kinds of things. Yes, but wait a minute. But then, how much is tolerable of that? You say you have no problem with the notion of German music. I mean, in other words, I, I agree with that, you see, but I'm just trying to rationalize that to say, well, that's acceptable to say, well, that's a German sound versus, let's say, a French sound or an English sound. But at what point does that become objectionable? When it, only when somebody says, um, only a German, only a German can, can do that. And I think in the end it's not so important. And then it's also, I mean, when I say German sound, it is for me simply a description yeah, of what it right. is. It's now, this, it, not the that. association. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, but yeah. there is a whole sort of philosophical concept of uh, 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 sound production and of music making that can be described as German, if mm. you want, mm. only for the purpose of association. And that is... Wagner talks a lot about it in his book uh, on conducting. The art of transition. In other words, if you want uh, philosophical terminology, that music is not about being, but about becoming. Mm. Yeah. And this is why this leads to all decisions about interpretation. This is why Furtwängler starts something like the Allegro in the um, third honor overture under tempo in a pianissimo under tempo, things that today are being criticized as being uh, old-fashioned old fashioned and limited at time. This is not at all the case. It is simply that he also used the element of flexibility of tempo for the purpose of making it clear that here is a fragment of notes, a group of notes, a musical small unit that is not here, but it is in the process of becoming. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he starts it under tempo, and only when it becomes more and more affirmative does the tempo go along with that, and then it is suddenly there. In other words, uh, if you want the, the so-called German concept of music and of music writing and of interpretation of music, is very much tied to the concept of transition mm. and that something is not what it is in itself but only in relation to what precedes it and what comes uh, uh, after that. And it, it is a philosophical thing. It is a philosophical thing, but, but you could also see, you know, that, I mean, the uses to which some of even Beethoven, whom we all think of as a kind of, a, you know, he's a kind of model, heroic somehow, uh, I mean, very different from Wagner figure, right? But you could see the uses that could be made of um, the, some of the military aspects of his music. I mean, the kind of triumphalism that you find in, in say, Fidelio. 
whether that too could become a kind of could be converted to ideological use. Well, I I I think uh, use is is perhaps not the correct word. It's more abuse. Yeah, abuse. It's misuse and abuse. When you think that every Nazi victory was announced in the on the radio in Germany to the sound of Le Prelude of, yeah, of Liszt, right? right. But you think, yeah. What has that music had to do with it? Absolutely yeah. nothing. If you read the poem of Lamartine, it has nothing to do with that. It has to with victory. It has to do with life being a prelude or some, to something else. This is called Le Prelude. If you if you if you use they play the the the, the last moment of the Beethoven uh, fifth as a symbol of victory. I mean, the Nazis managed to convince the world that the Ninth Symphony, that all people will be brothers, that this is what they were about. Yeah. It was played at all the great Nazi, Nazi occasions. No, but you, you wouldn't subscribe to the notion... I mean, it's a sort of tragic paradox in a way about it, that there's something in also... I mean, I, I see what you're saying about abuse. But could, I mean, couldn't you also say that there's something in the music, the sound of the... The, the symbols, I mean, C-Y-M-B-A-L-S, the snare drum, the triangle, you know, the kind of mili mil militaristic quality of some of Beethoven's music that also predisposes one to pick that uh, for those kind of ideological abuses. It, I mean, it's, a, it's also an aspect of the music, no? I'm, of course, like dance is. Yeah, right, right, right. And there, I mean, there's music for wedding, and there's music for, for yeah, yeah. ceremonies, and there's music for so the kind of, it's, funeral. It's, yeah. And the way, for example, military marches are played in war, I mean, to, and parades. I mean, I remember this, one of the earliest and strongest memories I have is during the British uh, period, both in Palestine and Egypt. I mean, the British were there during the mandate before 48, and in Egypt before they left, um, you know, in the, in the period of independence after World War II, is the marching bands. I mean, I think they were meant to fit, fill you with a kind of awe for the power of this, you know. And that's why, you know, military dictatorships use bands and parades, and mu music is always a very important element of that. And it gives a kind of... There's high dividend in emotional excitement. <laughs> exactly. It really exactly. And it's very cheap to do when you consider. Yeah. I mean, it, it, not much was required. And, you know, I remember the f when I was a child, the first time I went to Vienna was in 1952. Vienna was occupied by the four powers. And it's Graham Green time, you know, the third man. That's the same period. The same time, yes. Yeah. That's right. Mm. And um, Oystra came and played, and suddenly made thousand one hundred people that sat in the music fair absolutely feel friendly towards the Soviets. Yeah, right, right, exactly. You know, yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah. this is true. I mean, this is a, if you want the use, yes. the use of music for for bringing people together, in other words. Right. And in a way, in a way, what we did in this yeah, yeah, work, in the workshop also. is also that. Right. I hope no, it's, not misused, no, no, it's not misused. No, no, it's not misused because, I mean, in a way it's different though because, I mean, what happened in the workshop, uh, which I found particularly interesting uh, as watching it, I've never watched it before. Uh, I mean, obviously, I, when I played the piano, I used to practice. But watching a rehearsal of several, I mean, of more than one person, which is what you were doing with the orchestra, I'm, I'm thinking now, is a gradual sort of accumulation of experience, which builds and builds and builds to a level of a certain kind of clarity. In other words, there's a, there's a wonderful expression by an American critic. He says that the critic of literature it brings literature to performance. And in a certain sense, what a conductor does also is the same thing. He brings music to performance. In other words, not just inert. But that's very different because there is this process through which you live. And it's difficult to see how you could abuse that, though. You see what I mean? What could you say about it? No, but you see, I don't, I don't think that music in itself is moral or immoral. No, I agree. It has that. nothing to do it with that. It is that, right? immoral. Any more than culture is redemptive. People think it's all about humanity and all the rest you know, of it. If you so. want, you take... Take the, the, the last moment of the Beethoven 7 that we played yesterday. If you want to use the music to create the association for something that dances mm -hmm. and joy, mm -hmm. and you play that, and it has that. It has all the energy of the dance. It has the movement of the dance. It has the volume that accumulates. It. If you want to use it and create the association of something evil, 
powerful, mm. menacing, mm. distasteful. You can do it. The same music is, is, is that. And I think that, uh, that's why I say music is amoral, in the sense that it is not immoral. That, in other words, no, that morality... But, yeah, but, but, amor but amoral presents problems. But I mean, that's yes, of what course, Mozart played. Of course, of course it presents no, problems. You could but say I'm anything. saying it is amoral rather than immoral, in the sense that music has no relation with morality, like this, right, and right. that it is all in one. Yes, right, right. All in one. Yes. And this is why, this is where you get into problems with... Uh, with uh, uh, sometimes with characters in operas, right. when music is uh, uh, is involved, you know, yes. and and then you can twist it, and you can use the music unless you have, uh, have a good rapport between conductor and right. stage director, and right. the stage director is a very strong personality, can be used the music really for for to negative effect in the same way that if you have a strong conductor and a weak uh, stage director then the, he uses the music simply uh, the, the staging simply to correct but are you music. conscious for example when you conduct i mean the, the standard uh, charge brought against wagner is of course backmesser that backmesser is really an anti-semitic caricature now in the performances that you've conducted at bayreuth which i've seen with uh, uh, andrea schmidt, schmidt right Beckmesser is not that kind of figure. First of all, he's not dressed in the traditional way. He isn't a hunchback. He isn't a repulsive-looking figure who probably smells. You know, remember that book the guy wrote about how all these uh, sensuous associations with Jews. So, in other words, I, I, you you feel that you can be conscious in making of Beckmesser through the music and obviously with the cooperation or not of the stage director into a kind of a real figure and not a caricature of something. Well, I think that uh, uh, the Beckmesser is a Stadtschreiber, what do you call it in English? The, the yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a town clerk. Town clerk. He was also the head of the police in that time. In the village, he was head of the police. Yeah, so not, I mean, so how can you expect yeah, a Jew to be, to be head of a police and all no, that? No. I don't think, therefore, this is for yes. me the proof, if you want, right. that it was not intended as an anti Semitic character. Well, then there's the argument that the things that he sings, ah, ah, this, yeah. Having said that, yeah. having said that, having said that, I think that uh, the, the, he, he uses, uh, certain aspects of the of the zeitgeist of the time that ridiculed Jews, but I don't think that the, the subject of the opera is, is that. that. No, I agree. With you. I, I don't think Shylock is an anti-Semitic figure. Yeah. Beckmesser is not. not. Right, right. Beckmesser may have Jewish traits put onto him, which are meant to make people laugh or to ridicule the personage. Right. In other words, I think that Wagner was very much aware of the fact that in his time, if you wanted to ridicule something, which is the case here, I mean, the whole point about Beckmesser and the third act is that he is being ridiculous yes. and everybody loves him. Well, yes. if you want to ridicule somebody at that time in the late 19th century, you made him give him a little Jewish uh, uh, color to it and you had it in it. Yes, yes, yes. And I think this is all it is about. If I really believed that the Meistersinger was about uh, an anti-Semitic character, I wouldn't be able to conduct it. But uh, who, who, how, do, how is the claim made, which has actually been made in a book which I reviewed some years ago, that when you listen to the funeral march in the Eroica of Beethoven, you feel en ennobled and dignified. Uh, it's like a great experience. When you listen to the funeral march in Gitte Damerung, you feel hatred and hostility towards Jews. This is actually a remark by a historian and a scholar. I, to me, it's complete nonsense. It, it, it's total, you know, total nonsense. I mean, if you want to feel disgust, you can feel disgust. This yeah, and, 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 and case, Maybe yeah. this is because the, 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 the person in question felt disgust for the person of Siegfried and he feels that the whole thing was uh, bombastic and uh, ceremonial about uh, somebody that he... Uh, looked at uh, negatively. I mean, you know, it's like the funeral of Stalin yeah. or the funeral, you know. Yeah. I think the, the I mean, I mean, obviously the context is what determines it in the end, don't you think? Of course, I don't yeah. think there is anything either moral in the funeral march of the Eroica, nor anything immoral in, in the, the funeral march of, yeah. of 
But there's a book about that called Beethoven in German Politics and the use of Beethoven's music in Bismarck's time, in the, during the Nazi time, in the East Germany, and you know, it became everybody's. 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 everybody's you know, but I think that this is also very, a very interesting uh, question about the power of, of suggestion, of the music and of the performer, if you want, of mm -hmm. the performer. There are sometimes when. <clears throat> You read wonderful poetry, or you hear a piano recital, and you think, it is so simple. It is, see, if I could play, I would play it exactly like this. Right. If I could write poetry, I would write exactly this kind of poem. And in fact, I can do it although I've never studied piano and I can't write poetry. And then you have the other kind, you read poetry, very impressive, very impressive, gives you the feeling totally beyond me. I'm never yeah. in the world will I be able to come close to that. I'm in awe of that. Or you hear, it's a wizard playing piano octaves at yeah, 200, 300, miles an hour. 200 miles an hour and loud yeah. and everything. My God, to play the piano like this, you are in awe of that, never ever. And I find the first actually not only more satisfying, but much more productive yeah. and much more, uh, a much more beneficial right. uh, experience for the listener too. Yes, yes. I yes, mean, I, I have been in situations, I know, where I have played the, the piano to, you know, to audiences, you know, who thought, my God, you know. How does but he do it? In BS8. I'm sure there were many people there who were at the piano recital for the first time. Yeah, right. Yeah. And they must have thought, how, you know... How did he do it? How does he do it? You know, yeah. and the f Well, then it becomes, a, it becomes like a, f a form of athletic or acrobatic performance. Yes, you know, yeah. and it gives me great pleasure to yeah. be admired yeah, and all right, that. Right. But the, the, the warmth of the f reaction of... Yes. And somebody who listens and says, it is so, when you play it, it is so simple, it is so self-evident. Yes, yes. It's, for me, it's a much uh, more beneficial uh, right. reaction. Yeah.